Right. So today I'd like to talk about uh, uh, my work doing viral genome tracing for double-stranded DNA viruses uh, and our conclusion regarding uh, how um, could a virus capsid diameters may be quantized and what this might mean for other double-stranded DNA viruses. So <clears throat> first, why does viral genome structure matter? Well, there's you've you've probably seen lots of structures uh, of viral capsids which have been solved <clears throat> at all atoms resolution uh this is this is work that started back in the 70s and yet in all those decades no one has ever reported the structure of a single um d double strand dna viral genome not even one uh not until we published uh, uh this paper um uh, an AR from um, just uh, 2023. So, <clears throat> so why do we care about the viral genome structure? It's uh, well, there's there's quite a bit of work being done on uh, gene therapy vehicles. So, th there are certain types of viruses that are uh, better for delivering uh, genes to to certain tissues. For example, herpes simplex virus two is better for if you want to deliver to the central nervous system um, and um, but uh, we don't know since we don't know that much about how the DNA is packaged inside of it we don't know for example the, the upper limits of, of the payload size that can be delivered is it possible to overpack it to, to give it a payload that's bigger than its than its native genome um, for, for instance uh, it there there is also the possibility that we could develop an antiviral drug that would target uh, the DNA packaging. And of course, un until we really know how that works, um, we wouldn't really know how to how to target it. Uh, or at least, or at least n in terms of, uh, from a rational design perspective, we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about um, this virus called SU10. Uh, named after Stock Uni Stockholm University, it's discovered in Stockholm wastewater. It attacks E. coli. Uh, and I'm also talk, talk, going to talk a bit about P68. Um, and I'm going to show you how uh, we are going to exploit certain structural principles about double stranded DNA uh, viral genomes. Um, to help us overcome noise uh, artifacts and the, the resolution limits. Okay, so I'd like to start with P68. So this is a, a density map that we got uh, from Dominic Krevik and Pavel Plevka in the Czech Republic. And if you look closely at, at, the, at the density, um, you might notice certain uh, features that are, that are quite uh, a little bit uh, striking. So, so these these sort of cigar-shaped densities, uh, these are uh, DNA, presumably. But uh, if you look at what, what it's doing, it seems to do some strange things, like, for example, here, there's some sort of Y intersection. So you don't know, you know which, which direction the DNA is actually going. And actually, this happens several times. Uh, and there, there are a lot of things happening like this. So, so initially, w when I got this density map, I tried following, just basically choosing one of these two paths based on th considerations, uh, including which which of the connections was 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 clear, had, a, had a more density, or, or um, which one was more, more logical in terms of where the rest of the DNA was. Uh, but I figured out after a while that I was just tasting my tail. There's no there's no way we were ever, ever going to be able to make make a sensible uh, packaging out of this. And so I took a step back and said, well. What if these are all just artifacts? Right? So what, what if really there's an underlying, very regular uh, uh, pattern for packaging the DNA? Um, and if we just assume that, even if it's even if it's not consistent with all of the density, maybe we will uh, nonetheless be able to recover the, the parameters of, of that packaging. And so 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 what we did is is, is just assume that there's a a spherical spiral 
that explains uh, that 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 um that the DNA follows. Um, and then we just adjust the parameters of the, the spherical spiral uh, until it, it gives us the best possible explanation of density. Uh, and then we just ignore the fact that it doesn't match everywhere in the density map. The idea being that if it's an artifact, that means it's just that the, that the images are misclustered. Uh, uh, so, so, so we tried that, and actually the results were quite striking. Um, we found that even though the density map is so noisy, uh, so low resolution, we were actually able to, able to observe really sharp peaks in, or, or should I say, uh, troughs in a, a fitting energy uh, at certain distinct um, distances. Let, let's say if we're look, looking, scanning over radius, um, the, the, these, these troughs are exactly spaced in, a, uh, in a, pretty much the, the, the right distance to where they, they, they should be um, shells of, of, let's say if, it, if it's an inverted spool model, shells of, of DNA being wound inside the, the virus. Um, and they, they pretty much have to be that, right? Um, and then we, we adjusted the other, other parameters of the spiral, for example, the rotation about the polar axis, um, the pitch, and so on. Uh, and the, the, the final result was that if you look at these DNAs, um, what are they doing? Well, they, they're forming a pretty good hexagonal packaging pattern. In other words, this DNA from, from the second shell is fitting into the grooves between the DNA and the first shell. And that, that pattern continues inwards. Uh, again, this is a method that um, package the shells separately, independently. So, so we know... Um, so we know it must be right if it, if it recapitulated the, the, the correct, the, the only logical packaging um, uh, that uh, that we would expect to see here. Um, so, so that was actually uh, quite encouraging. Uh, there's there's quite a bit here that we can't see. For example, here close to the poles, the noise gets so bad that we can't, uh, we really can't infer anything. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to get quite a bit of, of, of DNA. And so this was the, basically the first um, all atoms density map uh, of, or sorry, all atoms uh, structure of a, of a double strand DNA genome uh, packaged inside of its capsid. Uh, there, there are a couple of caveats. Like we, 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 we don't know the register, so we, we can't say, um, uh, we can't align the sequence to specific um, points on this structure. Uh, we can't even get the right. Um, phase. In other words, uh, we can't even see the, the 10 residue turns. Um, but we can't, what we can see is the radius, uh, like I say, that the distance between traces or, or the pitch, uh, the rotation, and, and these, these overall uh, geometric parameters. Uh, so, so it's quite arguable that this is not an, really an all atoms model in that sense. Um, uh, nonetheless, we, we thought it was very informative. And, and you'll see why uh, when I switch to the next virus. Um, oh, by the way, this is incorrect. It's already uh, published. Okay, and so, so, so I alluded to this procedure where we assume uh, that we have a spiral, um, and then from there we, we eventually get to, to, to the all-out of structure. Let me go into that in a little bit more detail. So let, let's say we have a uh, kind of an elongated icosahedron, uh, not like the one I just showed you for P68, but rather one that has a, you know, a, a long cylindrical section or more or less cylindrical section in the middle and then uh, some, some sections that we could consider to be uh, spherical caps. So, so for the spherical section, we would use a spherical um, cylindrical sp spiral, right? Um, and we would, we can just look at the structure and get an idea of, of what its diameter should be in a center point. But but all these things we can optimize in a semi-automated way. Um, so this would take care of the cylindrical portion. And then again, for the, for the end caps, we would assume um, a spherical spiral. And this is just something, just a, a, a the, the only, just a function where phi is some constant times um, um, times theta. 
So so that that guarantees that there's going to be a fixed spatial distance separating consecutive turns of of, of the spiral. So which is exactly the property we want, right? Because the, the, the distance between DNA helices is is pretty much said by physics. Um, it varies a little bit, but it, it's um, it, it's it's mostly uh, more or less constant throughout the uh, throughout the virus. Um, okay, and so once you have this this onsets, then um, you place pseudo atoms or or single atoms represent each base pair of your DNA all along this spiral at just the right. This is 3.4 angstroms apart. And this you can uh, in, insert into your density map, and you can compute the fitting energy. So it's basically the dot product of all these nuclear positions times the um, with the uh, against the density. And so you're looking for for uh, the, the the parameters of the spiral that lead to to the lowest energy, meaning that the the spiral is aligned with the with the these sort of cigar shaped uh, densities that represent DNA. Okay, and and so 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 here again we, we we can get the reason we can get such sharp points representing the correct values of these spherical uh, these cylindrical or sorry spiral parameters is because we're 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 measuring the fitting energy not at a single pseudo atom or a single base pair, but we're doing it simultaneously over an entire stretch of DNA that might be hundreds of, of base pairs long, right? So so you when you sum over so much data. Uh, you, the central limit theorem uh, it tells you that that's your the uh, the uncertainty be, the, the keeps decreasing, like it goes like this one over square root of n. So so you, so even though your original density map might be 10, 20 angstroms resolution, your resolution in terms of the radius and the pitch and these other parameters might be a, a tenth of an angstrom. So that that, that was that, that was the key to this method. Uh, Okay, and so 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 you can do do a similar thing up here in the end caps. Here again, you'd need a spherical spiral. Oh, and uh, one more thing is that once you have once you've decided on the correct spiral parameters, you can turn these pseudo atoms back into uh, into all atoms. In other words, you can convert this to 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 a um, idealized uh, model uh, of DNA with with all its atoms. And again, that's that's the part that's not been done before. Okay, so uh, what does the density map tell us? So there are some things that this method uh, will tell you very quickly, which you know some of these things might be obvious uh, in retrospect, but but if you don't have a method that that does this for you, it might take you a lot longer to see it, even though it again looks obvious in retrospect. And one, one, the first one, the first thing we saw is. Okay, we, we saw it, it found a spiral going up like this. It's kind of following this density. And it kind of comes up out of the page, so you can't see it in this view. Let's just draw it dotted like this. And then it goes back and it follows another of these traces, and then comes back up. Uh, so one thing was, notice this is like, wow, look at this pitch. To me, that was a strikingly steep pitch. I, I had thought that the DNA would wind kind of like a, Conventional screw, where you have you know one thread goes around and it comes very close to to itself and then continues like that. But no, this is more like a one of these less common screws that has more than one thread, right? So this this has a basically a ten threaded screw, and so the the the, the virologists call this it would say it has ten points of entry. Um, and I didn't know this was possible. Of course, virus virologists uh, were not surprised at all. Uh, but um, the point is that it very quickly tells us that. Um, that what you have is a situation where you have um, it just multiple strands going in parallel up, up the up the cylindrical portion. So, um, and there, there's something else that's interesting. So here at the end cap, um, you notice that there's a there are these circular densities of of DNA, and that that, that seemed very odd to me because circular DNA. Is that even in there? Is that possible for there to be circular DNA in there? And I talked to Pavel, and he said, "No, it's absolutely not possible. There, there's only one way for the DNA to get in there. It gets pumped in by this packaging motor. Uh, it has to be one uh, continuous uh, helix of DNA 
from beginning to end. Like there, there's there's no plasmids or anything like that in there. So so that's not a circle. Um, so what is it? Uh, one more thing that you might notice is that even though this first circle is clear, look at this, the second one is a lot less clear. It's kind of later on. Later on, you're going to see that that in general the clarity gets less as you go in. But here is the opposite. Here the, the innermost one is most clear, and the ones that follow are are less clear. So 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 that that was kind of a question mark, and that's that's going to be an important one. We're going to come back to it. Um, so so basically, um, once we had all these spirals here in place, um, in the cylindrical portion, we started to think about what it's doing to turn around because. Because basically, if you have a spiral that goes up, it has to somehow turn around and come back down. Uh, and so, so basically, what we started to think about was that um, maybe what's doing is, is something like this, where it turns around and it comes back like this, follows a parallel kind of track, da, 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 like that. And then, uh, sorry, I drew this bit wrong. Um, and then it comes down. And so, let's say this is this is the early arriving terminus. It um, it parks somewhere close to the to the spindle, and we'll, I'll tell you why I think it parks on this end and not the other end. Anyway, so so it went up, it turned around, came back down, and this thing has to turn around in here, and it's going to follow the the innermost circle, and then come back out like this. And you'll see why why it has to be that innermost circle. And it comes up, and then it turns around, comes back down. Da 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 back down and here it also turns around and now it has to take one the, the the circle that's next to it in diameter and goes back up and turns around up there and comes back so so the thing the the, the key thing is that it makes a, the tightest circle kind of first or, or at least um at earliest it, it might not be that diameter initially maybe it gets tightened as it goes along but the point is that is that um, it does it first and the reason for that is is because that's the only way it can do it and maintain everything in the same layer like not having to cross DNA. Like if you if you make two helices cross, then you're going to get, end up with some tight, some small diameters, like you, a lot of bending strain, uh, inefficient use of space. There, there, there are a lot of reasons why it should prefer to stay, keep everything in this in this in the single layer. And also, there's no experimental evidence that that there are any level crossings, uh, as you would expect with with these cross DNAs. Uh, and 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 this scheme explains all these. Things we're seeing, like the 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 ring with the sensor ring having the highest and clearest density. Uh, so let let, let, let me uh, show it to you this way. This is the same thing, except now we're in a sense flattening out the cylindrical portion, and then we just kind of lay these these uh, these end caps. So they're kind of instead of like this, they're like looking at, looking at us. And so as I told you, that the, the DNA comes in through here. Here's a packaging motor goes way up to the other end, comes back around, and it parks here. So this is the early terminus. It goes up, and again, we're, we're flattening this out, but in the other view, it would, it would have been a cylindrical spiral. So anyway, it goes up along the spiral portion, takes the innermost kind of turn here, comes back down, and then here, it follows this innermost clearest ring, and then goes back up. And now we have an explanation for why that innermost ring was clear, right? It's because what you what you have it's not actually a ring, which you're seeing here. It's just a, an arc of DNA, uh, and it's not a full 360 degree arc. So, um, but nonetheless, it's an arc that covers a fairly large angle, right? Maybe it's not 360 degrees. Maybe it's just 300 degrees. I don't know. Uh, but whatever it is, it, it's able to cover a fairly large number of, of degrees. And then it goes up. And it makes a second turn, like this at the far end. Comes back down. And now it follows a second ring. And this one is not able to fill in as much of this sort of arc angle. So, so whatever the, the, the first ring was in terms of its arc angle, this is less than that. So there's just less DNA to average over. And so that's why you got less density. You go up to the other end now, distal end, uh, take a turn, uh, come back down, and you follow a third ring. 
And this, this one has even less of an arc angle. Comes back up, do the same thing. Come back down, take the fourth ring and come back up. And um, so now you have to have five turns at the distal end and four at the, at the uh, spindle end. And this, 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 this end of DNA, once it gets here, it's already used up all the 10 parallel tracks in the cylindrical portion. And then all these turnarounds, these, the, all the space is now occupied in the spindle dome. And so now it has no choice but to jump over and start packaging the next layer. Right. Um, so, so this is this is where it gets good. This is the, like the where where we get all the quantization that I was telling you about. So here we said that there's a number of points of entry that's equal to ten, ten parallel tracks of DNA. And again, now that the cylindrical portion is completely full, at least the first shell. Um, so for every two of these tracks going down the cylindrical portion, we need one turnaround up here, right? And so that means that the number of turnarounds here is NPE over two. So that's five turnarounds, right? This. Then when we get to this end, it's not five turnarounds because you have this early terminus, which doesn't actually end up making any turnarounds. And then you have this late terminus, uh, which arrives after all the space is, is, is being used up and, and, and it's just gonna jump over to the next shell. So it's this, this end has NPE over two minus one turns. So that's four turns, right? Uh, so there's, a, there's a, a direct relationship between the number of points of entry and the number of terms in, turns in the end cap. So the part about um, how the DNA is packaging in the cylindrical portion is, is fairly clear to me. Uh, the, also how these arcs kind of happen is also clear to me. The uh, exactly where the arcs end, though, that's very hard to say. Uh, it's possible that this DNA could have been pushed further in like this. It's just just a matter, uh, it, you know, it's 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 a matter of like saving space versus uh, paying the energetic cost of bending the DNA into a tighter radius. Uh, so so we don't know exactly what this looks like, but but topologically, I think this is what's happening. Um, and you can see again that here you have a fairly large arc angle, and then for the second ring, it gets to be much less. For a third ring, it's even less than that. And then for the ring, fourth ring, it's basically a little loop sticking in. It's, it's not, I wouldn't even call that an arc at all. Okay, that's, uh, yeah, and here I'm showing you the, the parked early terminus, and this is the late terminus, which is gonna hop over and start filling the next shell. Okay, and uh, so, so I told you there's a, there's a, this discrete number of number number of turns that is related to points of entry. Uh, and now, now I would like to argue that uh, this means that the capsid diameter is quantized. Why do I say that? Well, we said that that, that there were going to have to be four turns here um, at the spindle end, right? And remember, I told you that that the spacing between um, between these DNA helices is, is fairly conserved throughout the virus. I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on things like the, the, the packaging pressure and so on, surely. You know, maybe, maybe how, many, how many ions you have, things like that. But, but, there's to, to, but it's, to, it's certainly bounded by sterics. And, it's, it's, and they also don't, you also don't want to push those negative charges too close together. So, so that my point is that it's, there's a there's a certain distance between these the, that, that more or less has to be respected between strands. And so if we have four turns, that means we know exactly or, or, or fairly precisely how long this, this, this part of the, this, this sort of wall of the capsid has to be to accommodate those four turns, right? And then we see something very interesting. Here's this uh, protein in the middle. It's called a portal protein, portal like door. And what I found really striking about this, and it was striking from the very beginning, is how smooth and regular and sort of geometric it is. So you can see here there's, the, there's this, you know, sort of conical 
wall here, and, and you know, you can see it on both sides. It, it looks exactly like a like a perfect funnel. And if, if you look at proteins, most proteins don't have surfaces that look like this. They have loops that come up. There's pieces of secondary structure that look kind of like a bit of a jumble. Very rare to see a smooth surface, right? But this one is very smooth. And then it goes. It turns into. Then there's this kind of like the, this uh, kind of spindle uh, of the of the funnel, and that looks like a very small diameter tube. And it turns out that that this this diameter is also important. But first, if we look at this smooth wall, like one thing you might notice is that it's perfectly perpen almost perfectly perpendicular to the capsid wall, right? Uh, and it's just the right length to accommodate exactly four sh four shells of DNA. Uh, and you can see the density that tells us that at least for uh, yeah, at least for three of these, we can see we can see uh, with 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 quite good precision where those shells are, and, and and they're there. Even the four shell we can see to some extent. Um, so there are four shells there, uh, I, I think, and um, and the and the this wall length it has to be some integer number of these sort of shell thicknesses. Uh, so so that's a this this thing has a, is a very precisely determined uh, length here. And then I said that this 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 diameter here is suspicious. It's small, and then I looked it up, and it turns out that's it's very close to the minimum diameter about which you can wind DNA without losing its helicity, right? And it's also close to the diameter of a histone. So so I think this is this is going to be a conserved diameter ac across this family. Other coronaviruses are going to have very similar. Uh, spindle diameters, if if they have a spindle like this. Um, so now we have these three quantities that are that are very precisely fixed. Like the like I say, the, the spindle diameter that's probably a constant. This number of layers. It doesn't have to be four layers. Other members of this family might have a different number of layers, but it has to be an integer. Maybe it could be three layers. Maybe it could be five layers. I don't know. But but the length of this kind of sloping wall are going to go in jumps, discrete jumps. And likewise, the, um, the, the length of this sort of portion of the capsid is also going to go in discrete jumps. Like if we have, if there, if there were hypothetically a different virus that instead of having 10 points of entry, it had, let's say, eight points of entry, then this would have to be one, one less turn here, right? It would be at three turns. But nonetheless, it has to change in discrete uh, jumps. Right. So now we know, based on the number of points of entry and based on the base, uh, the the kind of the dimensions of this pore protein, we know that it has to be four layers deep, and then we know and we know the diameter of this spindle, or we expect we suspect that it will be conserved across the family. Then we know this distance, this distance, and then this distance. And, and of course, by symmetry, we know that it's the same one on the other side. So now we know exactly what the um, what the diameter, the inner diameter of this virus is going to be uh, as a function of number of points of entry and number of layers that are stacked on the portal protein. So two quantum numbers control the diameter uh, of this capsid. So we thought, okay, well then there must be other, we must be able to measure the capsid diameters of, of, of other viruses. Uh, and they, they would have to either be the same, or they would have to be be different, but in this in in this in discrete jumps, right? So, so I'd like you to look at these. Uh, we don't have any other cryogenic images, just SU10. The other ones have not been solved by cryogenic, but we do have some single particle images. So I found a few, uh, and you can read more about them in in our in our paper. But anyway, you can see here's here's a micrograph of another one, and I, and I, I scaled these so they're all on the same scale. Like basically, I, I scaled them until their their scale bars lined up. And, he, and I drew these lines from the inner capsid diameter of SU10 um, so I could compare it to the other viruses. So would you say that this virus has the same uh, capsid inner diameter as SU10? I would say so, right? And then, about, and then this one. I would say they also have the same diameter. This one... 
it looks like it doesn't have the same diameter. But this is a, this 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 image is much lower resolution. Um, we I would argue that we just don't know. This is just un, too too unclear to be able to to say anything. Uh, and then there's one more, and that one also matches, I would say. And then there's this one. And I would definitely say it does not match. So either it's got it's it may, either it's following the same packaging scheme, but it chose a different quantum number. Or it's got a different, uh, or quantum number, should I say? Or it's got a, it's it's got a completely different packaging scheme. <clears throat> and it's this one is the only one that's actually not a CUDA virus. It's from a family that's not too distantly related, but nonetheless, it's not a CUDA virus. So I just don't know um, which one of those two options it's taking, whether it's still following the same scheme but different quantum numbers, or whether it's a completely different scheme. So, but nonetheless, uh, of the four the other CUDA viruses that we could find three are de definitely having the same diameter. So not only is it quantized, it's choosing the same quantum numbers. Uh, and and, I, and I, there might be reasons why it likes these quantum numbers. I mean, there's a five-fold symmetry, so that mean, that might uh, be an incentive to go with a, a multiple of five in, for the points of entry. <clears throat> uh, and then then we, we started to think about uh, what, what this might tell us about other viruses. And so herpes simplex virus, one and two are, are DNA viruses. So, so we took a, took a look at HSV1, and this is much larger, and we do see, see certain important differences between this and SU10. Uh, not only is it larger, it's also uh, a regular aqueous region, whereas SU10 was uh, elongated. So, but but the, the pore protein is not the same. It's not a single cone. It's kind of a bilinear cone, if you can think of it that, that way. It's got these two two separate flat sections, um, and we also have this innermost ring that's clearer than the others, right? So that's 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 a feature that's in common. And then here's another ring that's a little bit less clear, right? We have, you know, sort of um, the same sort of layering system where we have a packed flat uh, layer of DNA, then followed by another layer of DNA and so on. Um, so I can't tell you uh, what the packaging rules are for herpes simplex virus one, where that's something we're working on, uh, but I do see s some some signs that there are going to be uh, some, um, some rules that are gonna be kind of uh, follow the same flavor, perhaps, as, as the rules that we found for, for SU10 and possibly all CUDA viruses. Um, and so I'd like to thank my collaborators, and uh, with that, I'll end my talk.